So in this section, we're going to look at some different kinds of phonological distributions and the constraints that correspond to them. Uh, now, a distribution is just the name for where features are and are not allowed uh, within a particular language. Um, and so, uh, for instance, the ones that we've been looking at so far are completely predictable phonological distributions. They don't have any particular context associated with them. And so they're context-free constraints that say things like, don't have voiced obstruents. So that's a completely predictable distribution for combinations of the features sonorant and voice, namely, wherever they occur, you can't have minus sonorant and plus voice together. And this is completely predictable throughout malady grammar. It doesn't matter what position or what context these features are in. Um, the, this is also, yeah, so there are also uh, various kinds of other uh, distributions in particular languages that are not entirely predictable and that are not entirely uniform across different uh, contexts. And so we're going to look at each of these possibilities in the rest of this uh, lecture. So um, <clears throat> here is a, a, an example from English uh, of a distribution of features that is not entirely predictable and not entirely stable across different contexts. Um, and this in particular has to do with the English tense and lax vowels. Now for all the examples in this section, um, I've given you the data set and then I put the answers in the last section of the handout. And that's because I want you to take a try at solving these uh, before I give you the solution. This is gonna be highly relevant to everything else we do in this class. Um, to all of your homework assignments, characterizing phonological distributions is maybe the single most important skill you're going to need to take out of this semester. Um, so here are some examples of English tense and lax vowels. And the first two columns here, uh, I'm just trying to show you that the tense lax feature in English uh, is contrastive. It's minimally contrastive. We do this using minimal pairs of word forms from English. These are pairs where the only difference between them is the feature in question, and the two words mean different things, right? So this first two examples, um, beat and bit, these are showing us that uh, the feature that distinguishes the E from the E vowel uh, must be contrastive in English. Right? This is because both of these are actually existing English words. They're both possible English words. They mean different things. Uh, therefore, uh, they must have some difference between them. Uh, and that difference, by hypothesis, has to be memorized in the lexicon. And so uh, the word beat has to be memorized in the lexicon with uh, you know, all of its contrastive features, including, importantly, plus tense, while bit is going to look exactly the same except it's going to be memorized with minus tense. It's a lax vowel in the lexicon, right? So this is, by hypothesis, the way that we represent contrastive features. They have to be stored in the lexicon. And another way of putting this is that in English, if I tell you, let me actually make this a phonetic form, that there's a word that begins with a voiced labial stop and ends with a voiceless coronal stop, and there's a high front unrounded vowel in between the two of them, and I ask you, is that vowel tense or lax? Uh, it is not phonologically predictable. You can't tell me the answer here unless you know which word it is. This is not like, say, Maori or Spanish, where if I gave you the same setup, uh, well, first of all, the word would be illegal in both languages, but forget about that for the moment. Pretend there's an extra vowel at the end. And I ask you, hey, is this high front unrounded vowel tense or lax? The answer is invariably tense. It's predictable and non-contrastive in Spanish and Maori, therefore doesn't need to be in the lexical entries. Well, in English, uh, this is unpredictable and it's contrastive. Therefore, it has to be memorized in the lexicon. The only way to get two words to consistently differ in their sound structure is for them to be stored with at least one difference in the lexicon. So minimal pairs demonstrate, they act as an argument, that some feature is contrastive in a language. Um, 
We can also use near minimal pairs. In minimal pairs, absolutely everything matches except for the feature in question. In near minimal pairs, uh, everything in the immediately surrounding context matches, uh, but there might be some other sound somewhere in the word that doesn't match. So an example of a near minimal pair uh, might be something like uh, bitter and beetle. Right? So here, these are two contrasting words that mean different things in English. Bitter, beetle. Uh, but uh, besides the difference between these two vowels, right, e, i, and e, we also have a difference at the ends of the two words here. They have different segments at their ends. We nonetheless uh, take this as evidence of a contrast. This is a near minimal pair because even though there's this difference at the end of the word, everything in the immediately surrounding context here, the preceding b, the following t, uh, is the same. Right? So this is a near minimal pair. For the purposes of this class, we're going to take near minimal pairs to be just as good as perfect minimal pairs. Um, and we might need to revise that in the advanced phonology class, but for right now, uh, near minimal pairs like bitter and beetle uh, are going to be just as good as perfect minimal pairs uh, for establishing that a feature is contrastive in some language. Right? So uh, those first two columns in number one here, the English tense and lax vowels, are showing us that for a wide variety of vowels in English, uh, this tense lax feature, plus or minus tense, uh, is contrastive. So beat and bit mean different things. Bait and bet, uh, pot and pat, suit and soot, uh, boat and butt uh, mean different things. Um, and then the third column, uh, we're looking at words where the vowel is final. So we can definitely get words in English like be, bay, pa, su, and bow. These are all existing English words. Um, what about the lax vowel alternatives? Be, be, pa, s, and b. So there's something going on here. There's a generalization in English. Um, and see if you can state what the generalization is. So unlike the inventory constraints that we've been looking at, uh, this is not a context-free rule or a context-free constraint. It only holds in a particular context. And this is like the example that we looked at uh, a week ago with Cyrenaic and Arabic low vowel fronting or backing, which was predictable following an emphatic consonant, but not predictable elsewhere in the English, uh, elsewhere in the language, excuse me. Um, and this is also uh, like uh, the unavailability of uh, word initial pn in English, which was another example we looked at, uh, where in general p is fine and n is fine, but in this particular context where they're together at the beginning of a word, not fine. So this is going to be a context sensitive constraint. Um, in English, the generalization, which hopefully you figured out by now, um, is that uh, the tense lax feature is not contrastive at the end of a word. Instead, it's predictable. And at the end of an English word, vowels are predictably uh, plus tense. So you can't have any word in English that ends in i, a, a, u, or a. So this is going to be um, a predictable property of English, but only in a certain context. So how do we write these ones? Um, we have a number of options here. As a constraint, we can just say that English does not allow sequences of a lax vowel, and if you want, you can put the vowel feature in here too, just to be maximally clear, even though you know there's no tense distinction for consonants in English. Um, and you can say that this doesn't happen at the end of a word, so just don't have these things together followed by that. You can also, if you want to be maximally clear about what's context sensitive and what's not, you can use the context notation. This is a backslash, and then it says, what's the position where you can't have a lax vowel? It's this position here, right next to the end of a word. And we use this pound sign for the end of a word in phonology. 
Um, so this means the exact same thing. It's just written differently in a way that makes it clearer that this is context sensitive. Both of them are right. Uh, in the rule version, you have to have the contextual slash. Um, and again, in the rule version, because there's more than one feature at issue here, there's potentially more than one way to write this. Um, the most sensible one would probably be to say that vowels are predictably tense in the context of a following word boundary. That is, vowels are tense at the end of a word. Um, there might be a way to do this that says that if you have a lax sound, it has to be, I don't know, a, a consonant or something like that. It doesn't make much sense. Um, but this would be the most obvious one. Now again, this makes assumptions about what would happen if you ended up with a lax vowel at the end of a word in English. There are certain exceptions, um, actually, that get pronounced. Uh, they tend to be words that are like interjections or exclamations or things that, uh, you know, are, are expressing some kind of an attitude. So the famous examples are uh, meh, which means that's pretty unexciting, meh. So that one ends with a, with a minus tense vowel. But other than those kinds of interjections, you don't really get uh, any words in English that end with a lax vowel. Um, so this is interesting, right? because uh, first of all, this is not a context-free constraint. It only holds in a certain context. And second of all, this feature now, plus or minus tense, is it contrastive and unpredictable in English? Or is it uh, non-contrastive and phonologically predictable? Well, the answer is kind of both. Right? It depends on which context we're in. So in the context of uh, word final position in English, this feature is entirely predictable. It's always going to be plus, predictably plus tense. Right? That means it's non-contrastive, and that might mean, depending on your theory, that you don't even need to store the feature uh, in your lexicon for word final vowels. In other contexts that aren't the end of a word, like beat and bit, right? or uh, bot and bat, or whatever, all the other examples I have here, um, now, all of a sudden, this stops being phonologically predictable. It becomes unpredictable and contrastive, minimally contrastive. That's what the minimal pairs show. And therefore, it must be stored in the lexicon. When you learn English words, you learn whether their vowels are tense or lax in these positions. You don't really need to learn that for a word final position. You just need to have this generalization, because the feature is phonologically predictable in this context. Here's another example for Maori. So Maori has labial consonants, like the bilabial fricative h and the uh, labial velar glide w, and it has round vowels, namely u and o. Uh, and these are perfectly possible in Maori. They're contrastive. They're in the lexicon. They contrast with other vowels. They contrast with other consonants. Um, and uh, even though Maori contains all these sounds, and they're all contrastive in some context, uh, there's certain combinations that do not occur. So uh, there are no words in Maori that contain sequences like huo, hu, wo, or wu. Uh, but we do have uh, words that contain combinations like po, pu, mo, and mu. Um, also no problem, words like hu, ho, Fa and wa. So here's a question. What precisely is prohibited in Maori? We have labial consonants. We have round vowels. We have some sequences of labial consonants followed by round vowels. We have many sequences of non-labial consonants followed by round vowels. Um, and of uh, labial consonants hua and wa uh, that are followed by non-round vowels. What's prohibited here? And how would you write that as a constraint? The answer is the specific thing that seems to be prohibited in Maori is labial continuance followed by round vowels. So hua and wa are the only two consonants in Maori that are plus labial and plus continuant. And it's just these two consonants that can't be followed by round vowels. So 
of star plus labial plus continuant followed by a round vowel. Here is a context-sensitive constraint in malady. Uh, and why are we formulated in this particular way? Well, these other available sequences that are shown in uh, the bullet points here are meant to show that this isn't just about labial consonants followed by round vowels. Po and mu are fine. Uh, those are labial minus continuant consonants, and it's perfectly fine for them to be before a round vowel. The problem is not with just continuants before a round vowel. We have sequences like ho and hu that contain a plus continuant ha segment followed by a round vowel. That's fine. Um, it's not just about, uh, well, I'm not sure what the alternative would be here. It's not just about labial continuance uh, followed by any vowel. So we do get qua and wa before other vowels. That's what qua and wa are showing. It's really about specifically labial continuance, this natural class of consonants, followed by round vowels, which is this natural class of vowels. So again, context-sensitive constraint. If you want to, you can leave out the contextual part and just say, don't have this followed by that. Uh, that's no problem. Um, as a rule, this would be quite complicated. There would be a lot of possibilities here. Uh, and uh, we really won't know which one is right until we get more evidence uh, from other kinds of mappings in Maori grammar. We're going to focus on that um, next week and the following weeks. But here are some possibilities. Maybe uh, if Maori speakers get a labial continuant followed by a round vowel, maybe the consonant changes its place of articulation. Maybe it changes its continuancy. Or maybe the following vowel changes its roundness. And we're not going to know until we see some more evidence. Uh, but for now, what we can say is that, well, these features are contrastive in Maori, and so are these. Uh, but uh, <coughs> in the general context, these can distinguish lexical entries from each other. But when you put uh, these features in this context, all of a sudden, uh, there is a predictable generalization that these consonants can't be labial and continuant before a round vowel. So uh, there is no possible contrast, for instance, between huo and hua. There is no contrast between huo and po, and so on and so forth. So again, uh, contrastive, unpredictable, lexically listed in most contexts, uh, but in some context, the value of the feature becomes phonologically predictable and non-contrastive. Um, this is referred to as positional neutralization or contextual neutralization of a contrast. What does that mean? Well, we have some contrastive feature in some language. Uh, you know, plus continuant is in the general case contrastive in malady. But if you couple it with the labial place of articulation and put it before a round vowel, it stops being contrastive. It is predictably minus in this position. Uh, similarly, labial place of articulation, generally contrastive in malady with coronal and dorsal places, but if you couple it with the plus continuant feature and put it before a round vowel, it stops being contrastive. That contrast neutralizes in this position or in this context, and so we call it positional neutralization or contextual neutralization. This is a uh, not entirely predictable and not contextually uniform distribution. So in part one, we looked at inventory constraints, which are totally predictable distributions and are the same across all contexts. Now we have one that's uh, partially predictable and partially unpredictable, and it differs between contexts. That's positional neutralization. Um, there are also distributions that are completely predictable but don't always have the same value across contexts. Um, so unlike inventory constraints, these are features that differ by context, but like inventory constraints, they're still predictable in all contexts. They just take on different values. And this is referred to as a complementary distribution or an allophonic distribution. So in the examples in section one, uh, we saw that the value of some particular feature 
uh, was predictable in some languages because they're always the same. So in English, all sounds are minus implosive, uh, all dorsal consonants are minus continuant, all final vowels are plus tense, and so on and so forth. Um, there is another version of this predictable distribution where the value is still always predictable, but it varies depending on the context. And so there's an example in two here, uh, another one from English, and this has to do with the distribution of oral and nasal vowels in English. Um, and uh, again, I'm going to leave the solution for the final part of the handout um, so you can try this on your own. Uh, the question is, um, is vowel nasality contrastive in English? Uh, and if not, then how do you predict it? So what are we seeing here? Um, in the general case, English has uh, oral vowels, as in the first column, bill, mate, pod, soup, dose, uh, and so on and so forth. It also has nasal vowels. Um, so if you look in prot, you will find that the vowels um, in that second column of words are mostly nasal. Uh, bin, maim, pawn, soon, and dome. Uh, and then the last two columns are just showing you a couple other contexts here. Uh, at the end of a word, you get oral vowels, may, pa, su, do. Uh, and before another vowel, you get uh, oral vowels. Mayor, sewer, uh, doughy, these are all uh, existing English words. Um, and so the question is, uh, is vowel nasality contrastive? And uh, if not, then what is the generalization about vowel nasality? So to know if it's contrastive, excuse me, the first thing we're going to need to do is look for minimal or near minimal pairs. Um, and you might think, looking at these first two words, bill and bin, uh, maybe that's a near minimal pair, because they're not exactly the same. Um, but it is not. So here's what's going on. Here we have an oral vowel. Here we have a nasal vowel. That's indicated with this tilde in the IPA. Um, and you might look at these and think, oh, so vowel nasality is contrastive. Uh, but this is not a minimal pair, because the vowels differ in nasality. But the following consonant is also different in these two cases. So it's not evidence for a contrast. In order to get a contrast, you would need oral and nasal vowels that are followed and preceded by the same consonant. And if you look through this data set, you're not going to find any of those because they don't exist in English. There are no minimal pairs for vowel nasality. Uh, and what that means in terms of our theory is that vowel nasality must be predictable in English. And in fact, you can predict where vowels are plus and minus nasal in English. Uh, if you haven't solved this yet, take a minute, try to solve it. Uh, so first attempt here, can we explain where vowels are minus nasal predictably? And uh, because we have three different columns, these correspond to three different phonological contexts here. Um, and it looks like there's not any very neat way of describing where the oral vowels occur. They can occur before a bunch of consonants, l, t, d, p, s. That's the first column. They can occur at the end of a word. That's the third column. They can occur before another vowel. That's the fourth column. And there's really no way to unify all of those contexts with a natural class. So this is sometimes referred to as a disjunctive context. It's either here or here or here. Um, or uh, theoretically, we refer to this as the elsewhere context. And what that means is that it's not really uh, an easy to generalize context. Uh, there's no natural class that defines the surrounding sounds here. Instead, it's just the sort of miscellaneous leftover contexts that you get once you've singled out um, a specific context for the other value. And that's what's going on here. Um, so in the second column, you can see this is the only place where the nasal vowels occur. What do these all have in common? Well, you know, Potentially, you can just look at this and say, oh, I get it. I see exactly what's happening here. Um, in other cases, it's going to be quite difficult, and you're going to want to actually list out what's going on. So where do we find nasal vowels and oral vowels in English? I'm going to demonstrate the general uh, 
long and involved way to solve these problems, you might not need that for this specific example, but there's going to be some problem somewhere in this class where you will need to do it this way. So we're looking at plain vowels or uh, oral vowels and nasal vowels, and I'm just going to list for each one of these what's the preceding context, what's the following context, and see if we can find any generalizations here. Um, so for the oral ones, uh, we've got a bunch of things like this. Uh, we've got uh, examples with a word boundary following. We've got examples with a, uh, another vowel following. And just looking down here, there's basically no generalization. I mean, these are all consonants, but that's about it. Here, you can't even do that. It's consonants and vowels and everything else. Um, how about these ones? Well, here's what we got. We found one in between b and n. We found one in between uh, m and m. We found one in between p and n. We found one in between s and n. And we found one in between d and m. OK, so now all of a sudden, we look at these, again, not much generalization about the preceding sounds, but looking at these following sounds, something ought to jump out to you here. Uh, namely, these are all nasal consonants. Look over here, we don't find any nasal consonants. So it looks like the distinguishing characteristic between oral and nasal vowels in English is whether or not the following consonant is a nasal. So this is the sort of long way to figure out phonological distributions. Um, and of course, it might be the case that you just look at that second column and go, oh, they're always nasal before a nasal consonant. But in the case where you can't figure that out just by looking, because it's not always obvious, uh, this is the long way to figure it out, in essence. Right? Um, so what are we seeing here? Uh, English vowels are predictably plus nasal when they occur before uh, a nasal consonant. And we might not need the consonant part of that because we don't have underlying nasal vowels in English, but I'll put it in just to be clear. Um, as a constraint, again, this is going to have to be context uh, sensitive. Don't have uh, <coughs> an oral vowel plus syllabic minus nasal followed by a nasal consonant. Oh, and I've not managed my board space well. Don't have an oral vowel followed by a nasal consonant uh, in English, right? This is a general constraint in the language. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is uh, characterizing the distribution here. We get nasal vowels before nasal consonants uh, and oral vowels elsewhere in this sort of heterogeneous set of contexts that really can't be characterized through any combinations of features or natural classes. Uh, that's the elsewhere context. So here in English, vowel nasality is entirely predictable, just like constricted glottis or implosive, or something like that, except unlike those features, where all uh, sounds in the language take on the same value for implosive or constricted glottis, no matter what context they're in, uh, in this case, vowel nasality is fully predictable, but takes on different values in different uh, contexts. And this is referred to as a complementary distribution for the feature plus and minus nasal, um, or an allophonic distribution. So this is a kind of distribution that's fully predictable, not uniform across contexts. And here's another example um, from our first class where we looked at the existence of this glottal stop in English. Um, and basically this occurs at the beginnings of large phrases or utterances in English when uh, a word or a phrase would otherwise be vowel initial. So here are some examples from English, eel, in, egg, amp. 
And if you put some other sounds before these words within a phrase, uh, here we use the indefinite article uh, uh or un, um, that long stop goes away, or it can go away at least. So anil, anin, an egg, an amp. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily say an amp, an egg, an in. Those are possible pronunciations, but only if there's a large phrase break there. In general case, you don't need the glottal stop in this context. Um, so one way of putting this is that uh, morphemes like eel, in, egg, and amp in English uh, show different realizations in different contexts, namely whether they're initial in a phrase or not. Well, other words like meal, pin, leg, and ramp do not show these different forms. They always take on the same form, regardless of whether they're initial in a phrase or not. So you have meal, a meal, pin, a pin, leg, a leg, and ramp, a ramp. Uh, so English, uh, we said earlier, never has contrastive plus or minus glottis, and this is, uh, sorry, plus or minus constricted glottis, or CG, and this is still true, it's never contrastive, but rather than being uniformly predictable in every context, it looks like there's one context where it's predictably plus constricted glottis in English, uh, namely utterance initially. Right? Uh, and so again, this is a feature that's fully predictable in English, but can vary by context. We have allophonic glottal stops, utterance initially in English. So, uh, we can say that the two values of features like this, that are uh, predictable but vary by context, we can say that they're in complementary distribution. So we can say that the feature plus or minus nasal for vowels uh, is it, are, are in complementary distribution, or that oral and nasal vowels are in complementary distribution. Um, and we refer to two sounds that are in complementary distribution as allophones. Uh, so we could refer to, for instance, uh, a and a, 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 uh, as being in complementary distribution in English, uh, as being allophones. These are uh, oral and nasal allophones of the low front vowel. Um, and we can also call this allophonic variation, which is the result of allophonic rules. Right? So all of these uh, vocabulary terms basically go together. Complementary distribution, uh, allophones, allophonic, uh, allophonic variation. You'll see these referred to in a lot of different ways. They're all referring to this situation. Um, now in classical phonological theory, allophones are taken to be variants of the same underlying sound, uh, which means that they're stored in the lexicon uh, as the same sound, and they don't contrast with one another because their distributions are predictable and they can't ever occur in the same environment. Right? So we found nasal vowels only before nasal consonants uh, in English, and the oral vowels, which I had to erase earlier, were only before other sounds that aren't nasal consonants, which means the oral and nasal allophones in English can't ever occur in the same environment. And if they did, then they would be contrastive, just like tense and lax vowels or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> so again, we would probably posit at some level that the vowels in had and pan Uh, can both be stored in the same basic form in the lexicon. We don't think these are uh, contrastive vowels in English, uh, but English speakers possess a system of implicit knowledge that entails that this one uh, is going to be predictably nasalized, while this one will not be. And so there's going to be two allophones of this low front vowel in English, a nasal one before nasals and an oral one uh, not before nasals. Right? Um, so this is uh, how allophones are work. Work. They're said to be uh, two uh, <coughs> allophones of the same underlying phoneme. Right? Uh, now we'll get back to phoneme in a second. One more thing about allophones. Um, these are typically hard for native speakers to distinguish. 
right? So it's not at all hard for English speakers to recognize that pad and bad sound different. But it's much, much more subtle. It's hard to convince an English speaker that they're producing a nasal vowel in pan. And that's because, well, at least in part, we think, because this is not contrastive, because you don't store it differently in your lexicon, uh, and because you've been trained in some sense to ignore the nasalization here, because it's not contrastive in your language. Um, it's possible that if you tell a French speaker that this vowel is nasal and this one is oral, uh, that might be less surprising to a French speaker because French speakers have contrastive vowel nasality. So it might actually be more obvious to a French speaker that this one is nasal, but native speakers of languages with allophonic variation very often are not aware of that allophonic variation and even find it hard to hear when it's called to their attention. Um, so for Spanish speakers, did you ever realize that the voice stop b is actually a continuant in between two vowels? If you've taken Spanish phonology or phonetics classes, you probably have, um, but you wouldn't necessarily know that. So in the general case, uh, in between two vowels, uh, you'll find that that b consonant is actually not a b at all. So if you pronounce the word bien in isolation, it's going to be something like this. Uh, but if you put another vowel before it, maybe by saying muy bien, it becomes an approximant. So this is written as a voiced bilabial fricative, and I've put this little diacritic on it to show that it's more open than that, actually. It's a, uh, an approximant rather than a fricative. Um, muy bien. And, uh, you know, again, because this is allophonic in Spanish, it's possible that you've lived your entire life speaking Spanish without ever noticing that this happens. Um, yet, it is uh, clearly a, a productive generalization in just about every variety of Spanish spoken anywhere in the world. Um, now, we're saying that these are allophones, and we'll often say that they're uh, allophones of a particular phoneme. Um, and so what we're referring to there is precisely this idea that both of these sounds can be stored the same way in the lexicon. You don't need to have the feature plus or minus nasal specified on English vowels because it's completely predictable from the context. Uh, namely, it will be plus if the following sound is plus nasal and minus elsewhere. Right? So we could say that these are both stored as a single phoneme in the English lexicon. Uh, and these, uh, the oral and nasal variants are going to be allophones of this phoneme. Um, <clears throat> this is why we sometimes say that the lexical representations of morphemes, these underlying representations, or URs, we say that they're phonemic in the sense that you don't need to store redundant or predictable phonological information in these forms. We only need to store contrastive or unpredictable information. Um, and when we write them between these slash marks where we're saying this is an input form or an underlying representation, uh, we call these uh, transcriptions phonemic transcriptions. So we're not putting in details in here that are completely predictable in English. Um, and, you know, we're focused on the nasal vowels right now, but English is full of these kinds of details. For instance, in the general case, both of these initial stops are going to be aspirated in English, or uh, plus spread glottis. We don't write that in the lexical entries because it's entirely predictable from the fact that they uh, are word initial and precede a stressed vowel. Right? That means that always voiceless stops in this context are going to be plus spread glottis, we don't need to put that in their underlying representations because it's completely phonologically predictable in 